Um, good morning and welcome. Uh, welcome whether you're here in person uh, uh, or watching live on YouTube or watching us on Catch Up. Um, you have to forgive me, I've, I've got a bit of a summer cold at the moment, so it, it, I'm sounding particularly sexy. Uh, <coughs> but you, you, may, you may have a different... Uh, uh, a different opinion ab about that, which is okay. Um, a an Australian atheist was backpacking in Scotland. It was late afternoon, so he pitched his tent on the shore of Loch Ness and threw a couple of steaks on the barbie. After he'd eaten, he got into a boat with the intention of spending a quiet evening fishing. Suddenly, his boat was attacked by the Loch Ness Monster. In one easy flip, the beast tossed him and his boat a hundred feet into the air and opened its mouth, ready to swallow man and boat as they fell back to the water. Struth, he exclaimed, as he tumbled head over heels towards the open jaws of the ferocious beast. In desperation, he cried out to God, Lord! If you're there, help me. Suddenly, the scene froze. As the atheist hung in midair, a booming voice came out of the clouds and said, It's nice to hear from you, my son. I thought you didn't believe in me. Stone the crows, Lord. Give us a break, the man pleaded. A minute ago, I didn't believe about the Loch Ness Monster either. <coughs> well... Well said God, now you're a believer, you must understand that I don't work miracles to order, so I won't snatch you from certain death in the jaws of the monster. But what I can do is change hearts. What would you have me do? The Aussie thought about it for a minute and then said, well, uh, fair dues, Lord. I'll tell you what then, will you make the Loch Ness Monster believe in you too? <coughs> So be it, replied God. Suddenly the man found himself falling again in inexorably towards the water. As soon as he looked down to his delight, he saw that the monster had bowed his head, shut his eyes, put its claws together, and was in an act of penitent reverence. Hallelujah, Lord, the man cried. I do believe he's actually praying. Don't get too excited, my son, replied God. He's actually saying grace. <coughs> okay, a, f a few weeks ago, I spoke on aspects of prayer, uh, and I want to return to the topic again. Uh, it is, it's strange for me to be speaking on the subject of prayer because, uh, like a lot of people, it isn't something I find particularly easy. Um, so this morning's message is as much for me as it is for any of you. Uh, this morning, uh, I want to talk on Jesus' teaching about persistence in prayer and the blessing that God wants to give us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, uh, and just as much God as the Father and Jesus and it's his job to help us understand and act upon what God wants us to hear. So let's start our service by standing and singing, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Oh, 
Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can talk to you through the miracle of prayer. It amazes us that the creator of the whole universe is sufficiently interested in us as individuals to want to hear from us. It amazes us even more that you want to have a relationship with us so much so that you didn't let our sin get in the way, but rather you sent your son Jesus to pay the price for us on the cross so that if we accept him as our saviour, we can have unfettered access to you. Father, not only is prayer a miracle, but for many of us it's also a bit of a mystery. We don't think we're any good at it. We struggle to make time for it. We don't know what to say. And we wonder whether our prayers are falling on deaf ears. Forgive our failings and help us, we pray. This morning, I pray that as we look at this subject again, 
will be encouraged to pray more frequently, more persistently, and more in line with your will. Help us to develop a healthy prayer life and a stronger relationship with you. May the Holy Spirit help us to concentrate, worship, and to hear you speaking to each of us at our point of need this morning. May we meet with you and be changed by the experience. And we pray this morning for our friends and family who are struggling at this time. We remember those who are beset with health, work or financial concerns. Those who are lonely and those who are struggling with temptation and sin. Some situations we're aware of and others may be known only to them and to you. Whoever they are and whatever their needs, we pray that you will help them, strengthen them and meet their needs at this time. Father, we've been shocked by the events that have taken place in Afghanistan in the last week, where the Taliban has taken control of the country so easily, leaving much of the population scared that the comparative freedoms they've enjoyed will be taken from them as a repressive Islamic regime is put in place. We pray that you'll protect your people and the fledgling church in Afghanistan, which has emerged in the last 20 years. Give them courage and peace. We pray that you'll protect those who are fleeing the country as refugees and give wisdom, grace and skill to the governments and aid agencies seeking to help them. We pray that you'll protect those who were part of the previous regime and those who worked with the Allied armies who were stationed in the country. And finally, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of the Taliban leaders. May they honour their pledges of amnesty for people and freedoms for women and that Afghanistan will not become a haven for Islamic terrorists. We pray that somehow you'll bring good out of what seems to be a very bad situation. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Okay, just a quick reminder about our church picnic uh, on Saturday the 4th of September at 3 o'clock uh, at Thurston Country Park. Um, bring your own picnic. Uh, we'll be meeting near the, um, the, the normal barbecue site, which isn't in operation at the moment. Uh, just a reminder, too, that parking charges apply. Um, and uh, looking on the website, um, I don't think you can pay with cash. You either have to pay with a card or, or, or with your phone or with an app. Um, uh, so be prepared to to pay a modest amount for parking. Um, okay, uh, let's watch a, a kid's cartoon uh, about prayer and then listen to David Suchet reading from Luke chapter 11. During Jesus' time on earth, he prayed a lot. He knew that prayer would keep him close to God, his Father. Sometimes Jesus would pray with others, like when he asked Peter, James, and John to come with him to a mountain to pray. Other times, Jesus would leave his disciples and pray by himself so he would have time alone with his Father. When Jesus prayed, he prayed for all sorts of things. He prayed for his disciples, for those in need of healing, and for little children. Jesus even prayed for us and asked his Father to watch over us. That's right, Jesus prayed for you and for me. Through Jesus' prayers, we can learn how to pray too. Jesus used the Lord's Prayer to teach His disciples to pray. It wasn't long and fancy. He showed them that they could pray in a simple way about many different things. Our prayers can be the same way. Jesus also taught us that we should pray without giving up. 
God is always listening to what we say. The way he answers our prayers might be different from what we expect, but we can always trust his plan for us. So the next time you're happy or sad, or worried or angry, or just need help, talk to God about it. He listened to his son's prayers, and he'll listen to yours too. Luke chapter 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Bible tells us that Jesus often got up early in the morning and went off alone and prayed. But on this occasion, he's praying in the presence of his disciples. It may have been silent prayer with his eyes closed, or it may, as recorded on other occasions, have been eyes open, looking up to, to heaven and out loud. The Bible doesn't say. Anyway, his, his disciples recognize there's something in Jesus' prayer life they're lacking. And they ask him to teach, him, teach them how to pray. So Jesus tells them to use the pattern that we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer. Although here in Luke's account, it's a shorter version uh, than the one we're familiar with from Matthew's Gospel, where it forms part of the teaching we call the Sermon on the Mount. Now I don't think this is a case of Luke leaving some bits out, but rather I think it's uh, a, a, the record of a different event where Jesus repeats something that he'd previously said, but in a different context. The Sermon on the Mount was given early in Jesus' ministry, where he's teaching a large crowd on a hillside in the northern Galilee, region of Galilee. Luke's version, by contrast, is later in Jesus' ministry. He's been with his disciples now for some time, and it didn't take place on a Galilean hillside, but rather took place while Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem. By this stage, Peter had made his key confession that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus has been, figured, been transfigured in front of some of his disciples. Things are getting progressively more focused and as Luke puts it, Jesus set his face, that is, resolutely set out, for Jerusalem. 
I suspect Luke's use of the phrase set his face is a deliberate echo of the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah where it talks about the suffering servant setting his face like a flint. So the context here is that Jesus has al al already has the crucifixion in his thoughts and his focus is on preparing his disciples to carry on his ministry after he leaves them. I don't intend to go over the same ground I covered last time I spoke, but if we quickly look at it again, we can see that Jesus says, when we pray, we should start by recognizing who God is, our loving Father who wants to hear from us, but who is also totally pure, the holy God whom we should respect and worship. Then Jesus says, before we get on to our shopping list of request, requests, we should focus on God's will first and pray for God's kingdom and purposes to come to pass. Then we should ask God to provide our essential needs, both physical and spiritual. We are to ask God to forgive our sins and are reminded that our forgiveness by God is conditional on our willingness to forgive those we consider to have wronged us. The battle against sin is tough, so we should return to God regularly to ask him to cleanse and forgive us, and we should also pray for him to help us to resist temptation and to protect us from the evil one, Satan, who wants to corrupt us, defeat us, and draw us away from God. So there it is, Jesus' outline for prayer. It doesn't have to be long, it isn't complicated, it doesn't need a special prayer vocabulary, but if prayed with sincerity, it's powerful and effective. To put it another way, it's the depth and not the length of our prayers that matters. So if prayer is so easy and uncomplicated, why do we find it so hard? Well, I think it's because when we pray, we're involved in a battle. A spiritual battle where the devil wants to interfere with our communication and relationship with God. It's also a battle where we need to fight against our weak human nature that doesn't want to make the time. It's oh so easy, it lacks the faith, it will make a difference and expects instant answers. Okay, let's watch another video. Kids, you might want to watch this one uh, because it includes an unexpected visit from a giraffe. Imagine there was a man. He's out walking. Can you tell it's nighttime? It's dark. He goes to his friend's house. Maybe it's his neighbor. And he starts yelling outside. I wonder why he's yelling. Hello, neighbor! Neighbor, please! I need some help. I need you to lend me some bread. Can I please have three loaves of bread? But you see, the house is all dark. His neighbor is sleeping. It's in the middle of the night. So the friend keeps yelling. Please, please, you see, I had some visitors come to my house and I don't have anything to feed them. They've come on a long journey and I'm out of bread. The markets are all closed and I can't get any bread anywhere. Please, neighbor, neighbor. Please, neighbor, open up. Come and, and help me. I, I, I really want to, to feed my guests and, and be a good host, but I don't have any bread. 
But his neighbor, maybe his neighbor's already gone to bed. And his children are all in bed. They were all sleeping. The neighbor doesn't want to get out of bed. He just wants to stay in bed. So maybe at first he pretends he doesn't hear anything. And he just sits there. But the man keeps yelling. Oh, neighbor, come on. You gotta give me something. Please. You gotta come and help me. I just need three loaves, I'll give them back. Oh boy, uh, Joy Giraffe, what are you doing here? Um, yeah, I, I don't remember you being part of this story. Uh, what? Yeah, and hurry up, we're hungry. You're hungry? You're hungry. The man, the man who wants to feed his friends. But what's that, Joy? You say that you're one of his friends that came to visit? Oh, silly giraffe. No, 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 no. Okay. Joy, I know you do this. Like, every week in kids' church, you come and, and say silly things. But you know what? You really need to get out of the story right now so we can finish it, okay? Okay. Thank you, Joy. We'll see you later. Uh, wait, Joy, do you think you could... Um, Take your bubbles away. Okay, thank you, Joy. Okay, so where were we? Oh yes, yeah. so the man is yelling at outside. He wants his neighbor to get up. He wants his neighbor to uh, to lend him some food because he, he wants to feed his guests that have traveled a long way. So the neighbor can't keep ignoring the man because the man keeps yelling. And <clears throat> so finally the man gets out of bed. And he jumps over and he comes to the window and he says, Okay, 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 I'm up. What is it? What do you want? Where, where are you yelling out my window? And he says, I need three loaves of bread. Please help me. A guest has come from a long ways. They've traveled. They're hungry. But, oh, well, I hadn't gone to the grocery store. And so we didn't have anything to feed them. Please, neighbor, if you lend me three loaves of bread, I, I will give them back to you. I just need... I just need to borrow them. Well, in Jesus' little story, the neighbor finally gets up, gets out of bed, he gets some food, and he gives it to the man. Why does he give it to the man? Well, because the man kept asking. He wouldn't go away. He kept asking for the bread, and finally the neighbor decided to help him. I'm sure the neighbor wanted him to quit yelling so that he could go back to sleep. But because this neighbor was his friend, he finally got out of bed and gave him the bread. Boys and girls, God is not like a grumpy neighbor at all. God loves to hear us pray. And Jesus told us this story because he wants us to know that our Heavenly Father loves us so much he wants to give us good things. He's not going to give us bad things if we ask for good things. He wants us to come and pray to him. Jesus finished this story by saying, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. How about you boys and girls? Are you praying? When you are worried, do you pray? When you need something, do you pray? When someone gets sick, do you pray? Jesus wants us to pray. God wants to hear our prayers. The end. Okay, Joy and Jerry. Thank you, thank you. Goodbye, kids. Just picture the scene. It's the middle of the night and it's pitch black. There are no street lamps, there's no electricity, there's no telly or internet. So everyone goes to bed shortly after sundown. And there's a knock on the door. And the householder wearily gets up and goes to see who it is. He opens the door and he sees by the flicker of an oil lamp that his visitor is carrying his friend from a distant village who's traveled by night to avoid the oppressive heat of the day. He's surprised because he had no idea he was coming, but
but he's nonetheless pleased to see his old acquaintance. Come on in, friend, he says. Make yourself at home, as he lights his own lamp. He wakes the rest of his family. Look who it is, he says. I presume you've eaten, he asks. Um, actually, no, his friend says, and I'm starving. No problem. Darling, he shouts to his wife, what have you got left from your baking this morning? Nothing, his wife replies. You ate the last loaf with your supper. Do you want me to light the fire again? It'll only take an hour to get it hot enough to bake. Don't worry, says the visitor. I'll go without. No, 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 that won't do at all, says the householder. What kind of host do you think I am, leaving his friend unfed? I'll never live it down. No, I'll go and see Bill. He'll sort me out. They always bake more than they need. So off goes our householder uh, to his friend a few doors down, more concerned with his reputation as a host than as a neighbour. He knocks on Bill's door, quietly at first to avoid disturbing the neighbours. There's no answer, so he knocks a bit louder. Still no answer, so he starts to knock louder still until eventually, who is it? And what do you want? It's Fred. I need to borrow some bread. What? At this time of night? Have you been drinking or something? We're all in bed. Leave us alone. And Bill puts the pillow over his ears and snuggles down under the covers. Fred is still at the door listening. Is he getting up or not? It doesn't sound like it. So he starts banging on the door as hard as he can and shouting out to Bill to let him in. By now, Bill is really irritated, but he's also really concerned about his what his neighbours will think. So he gets up and picks his way in the dark to the door. He's still half asleep and it's pitch dark, so he stumbles over the furniture treads on the toys his kids have left on the floor, stubs his toe, scrapes his shin, and curses several times, but eventually he makes it to the door. He opens it to his friend and borrows his lamp and picks his way back to find the last three loaves of bread left over from the previous morning's bake and gives them to him. Fred is just about to say, thanks mate, I owe you one, when Bill stops him and says, through gritted teeth, don't say another word, and shuts the door in his friend's face and picks his way carefully back to bed. And Jesus says to his disciples, the man got what he wanted, not because he was able to call in a favour from his friend, but because of his shameless audacity or his desperate shamelessness. In short, he persevered and persisted, made a real nuisance of himself and wasn't going to take no for an answer. And Jesus says that's a picture of how we should pray. So let's sing another song at this point. This is the air I breathe, which talks about our desperate need for God. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence. Living in me This is my daily bread This is my daily bread
The thing that we should take from this story is that that is how we should pray, with shameless audacity. We should hang in there and persevere until we get an answer. Whenever we have a need, we should pray with desperate shamelessness for God to fulfill our need. It's important to understand that whilst the story is a picture of how we should persevere, it's not a picture of what God is like. God is not like the grumpy friend who has to be dragged reluctantly out of bed to open the door at midnight. No, he's the opposite. He welcomes the knock on his door at midnight or at any time, and there will always be an answer even if we sometimes struggle to recognize it. To make this point, Jesus goes on to say, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Is Jesus saying that God will give us all our requests? Well, if you read the statement, ask and it will be given you, and everyone who asks receives out of context, you could very well be forgiven for thinking so. But the context is all important. Prayer isn't a blank check, and the context in is in which Jesus uh, says, ask and it will be given to you, is his teaching on the content of the prayer laid out in the Lord's Prayer. As I explained when I last spoke, while, whilst prayer is not a blank check, there is a sense in which it's a bit like a blank check, but it requires two signatures. Our signature and Jesus' counter-signature. It's a bit like each Christian has a checkbook for the bank of heaven and when we make a prayer request to God it's like writing a check which is presented at the bank for payment. Now unless that check is countersigned by Jesus God won't act upon it and Jesus will only countersign checks which are in keeping with his will. 
So when we present our prayer request to God, we should do so with shameless audacity. But also ask ourselves, is this something that Jesus would be happy to countersign? The kind of things that we can be sure to get a positive answer are listed in the Lord's Prayer. Things that are truly going to promote God's holy name and help his kingdom to come. Genuine, genuine physical needs and spiritual needs like wisdom, forgiveness of our sins, help in being gracious and forgiving towards others, strength to resist temptation and protection from the devil. Sometimes when we ask, we get an instant yes, or sometimes a delayed yes, where God says yes straight away, but waits and chooses the right time to act. Sometimes the answer will be an emphatic no, because it isn't right or helpful, and we may need to keep praying whilst God works on our heart until eventually we figure that out. <clears throat> and sometimes the answer is wait. The time isn't right or things need to change for God to give the green light. The words ask, seek and knock that Jesus used are continuous verbs. So they are perhaps better translated, keep asking, keep seeking or searching, and keep knocking. Because God isn't always going to give an instant answer. He wants to test our sincerity and develop our character. Prayer is an opportunity for us to experience God and for God to change us. We must not play at prayer, but must show persistence if we don't get an immediate answer. God is willing and eager to give, but if we don't want what we're asking for enough to be persistent, we clearly don't want it very much. And if we don't want it very much, much why should God answer? such half-hearted prayer. We see a good example of this in the Old Testament. After King Solomon had built the temple, God appeared to him and made him a promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The people weren't just to pray a quick, casual prayer. They were to humble themselves and repent and seek God's face in prayer and stick at it to demonstrate their sincerity. Perseverance is one of God's conditions for answering prayer. So if we're convinced that what we're asking for is in line with God's will, then we should keep on asking, seeking and knocking and recognise that persistence is for our benefit, not God's. He isn't slow or uncaring. He doesn't need persuading. We need to stick at it to demonstrate to ourselves and God that the that it isn't just a passing fancy. And if we're convinced that what we're asking for is in line with God's will, and he doesn't seem to be answering, then we should seek to find out why. What really is God's will in this matter? Maybe we've got it wrong and are praying for the wrong thing. Again, when I spoke last time, I used the example of the Apostle Paul who had some kind of serious physical affliction, but the Bible doesn't tell us what it was. But Paul described it as his thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan 
that tormented him. He persisted in prayer for God to heal him of it. He says in his letter to the Corinthians that he repeatedly pleaded with God to take it away from him. And eventually he got an answer from God, which was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That was the answer which Paul needed and he rejoiced in it. Whilst he would have liked God to take away his suffering, what he really needed was reassurance that he would be enabled to cope. And he learned to rejoice in God's promise that he would actually use Paul's weakness to keep him humble and totally reliant on God. God used Paul's perseverance in prayer to make him do a complete 180 in his thinking and desires and make him even more effective in his ministry. At this point, it's important to say that we mustn't be stopped from praying because we're concerned that what we're praying for is the wrong thing. God wants us to pray regularly for any and everything and to build up a relationship with him. He wants our bad prayers just as much as our good prayers because he wants to use prayer to change us. The answer to prayer isn't simply God's yes or no. The answer to prayer is God himself. The answer to prayer is being in his presence and knowing that he is with us, loving us, strengthening us, journeying beside us, beside us, regardless of any yes or no he makes to our requests. Now one of the things that sometimes stops people from asking things of God is the fear that he might give them something bad or they won't like. We're afraid to ask because we think it's the wrong thing or too small a thing or too big a thing or he might say no or if we ask for guidance he might tell us to go and be a missionary in outer Mongolia or if we ask him to come into our life we suddenly lose control and become a different person. God loves us and he only wants the best for us. And to make the point, Jesus said, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? Of course not. Equally, if, you are, if your son asks for a snake or a scorpion, you'd think long and hard before you gave him one. You would want to protect your son from a foolish or harmful request. And Jesus makes the point that as humans, even though compared to God, we are evil, we wouldn't dream of giving our children anything nasty or harmful so we can be sure that God, who is totally good, will not give us anything that isn't for our own good. And after our salvation, the greatest gift he can give to those who ask him is the Holy Spirit. When we become a Christian, God the Father gives us God the Holy Spirit to live in us and to help us and strengthen us in our lives in order to make us think and act more like Jesus. New Christians often feel a freshness and spiritual vitality that they've never experienced before. God seems close, prayer seems easy, the Bible comes alive and changes start to take place in our attitudes and behavior as we unconsciously allow the Holy Spirit to start making us more like Jesus. The 
problem is that for many of us, as time goes, up, goes by, we start to get a bit stale and we develop a spiritual dryness. It creeps up on us uh, so we don't notice. But the early spark of our Christian life is replaced by routine and duty. We love God, but we've lost the sense of being in love with him. Our relationship with God has lost its freshness. God feels distant and we rarely speak, uh, but we rarely hear him speaking to us through prayer, preaching or Bible reading. We serve more out of a sense of duty than desire and we continue as we continue to give. We feel increasingly weary as we're running on empty. If that describes you this morning, then I'm here to tell you that God wants to refill your tank and restore the freshness and vitality to your walk with him. So seek his face and ask him to fill you again with the Holy Spirit. And keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking until he does. I'm missing, a, I'm missing a slide, or they're in the, they're in the wrong order. Um, <clears throat> the great American evangelist, um, uh, D.L. Moody, found himself in an extreme state of spiritual staleness. He wrote, I got into a cold state. It did not seem as if there was any unction resting on my ministry. For four months, God seemed to be, to be just showing me myself and my own faults. I found I was ambitious. I was not preaching for Christ. I was preaching for ambition. For four months, a wrestling went on within me, and I was a miserable man. But after four months, the anointing came. Ah, what a day. I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It's almost too sacred an experience to name. I can only say that God revealed himself to me and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. After this, Moody went back to preaching. The sermons were no different. He didn't present any new truths, but the results were dramatically different with many more people being saved because the Holy Spirit was at work in a new and powerful way in his ministry. And Moody's whole outlook had been changed forever as he was renewed and strengthened by a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. He said, up to that point, I was all the time tugging and carrying water. But now I have a river that carries me. Let's sing our final song, Consuming Fire. Feel free to sit or stand. If you're feeling spiritually stale, use it as a prayer to cry out to God. There must be more than this Oh, breath of God, come breathe within There must be more than this Spirit of God, we wait for you Fill us in you
the missing slide of uh, D.L. Moody. <laughs> Handsome fellow, isn't he? Um, <clears throat> right. Um, just before uh, I finish with prayer, uh, I'd like to say something for any who are here or are watching this morning who aren't Christians or are unsure. Uh, I have some good news for you. You don't have to persevere for months searching and seeking for God. You can start a new life in relationship with God, the Heavenly Father, today with a simple prayer because of what Jesus has done for us. You don't need to understand everything. You only need to understand your need for forgiveness and have a desire for a new life in relationship with God. All you have to do is ask and mean it, and God will do the rest. You don't need to use fancy words. You don't need to pray out loud. You don't need to kneel down or put your hands together in a special way. You just need to talk to God in your heart. And if you want to do that, you can do so now as I pray. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, you want a close personal relationship with each of us and you've given us prayer as the means by which we can communicate with you. Forgive us that we often see prayer as a last resort than as our first port of call. And forgive us too that we struggle to persevere in prayer when that's the very thing you want us to do so that you can bring about change, both in circumstances and in us. Father, I pray uh, for any here this morning or watching on YouTube who haven't given their lives to you yet, but who want to. I pray they will echo this prayer in their hearts right now. I pray they will recognize they are sinners and they will ask you to forgive them because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, taking upon himself the punishment that we all deserve. I ask that you will strengthen them in their newfound faith and you will help them to repent and turn from sin. I pray that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit as Jesus promised. And I pray too for those of us who've been on the Christian journey for many years but who are now experiencing a spiritual dryness. You know our hearts. You know the reason for this. If we're holding on to uncon unconfessed sin, help us to recognize it and seek your forgiveness for it. And if we need to forgive others, then help us to recognize that and to forgive them and to release them and ourselves. I pray that you'll fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit and keep filling us. Help us to persevere in prayer and to keep asking, seeking and knocking until you bless us. May our dryness be replaced by a river of living water which carries us. And may your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives for your honour and glory. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Thank you for joining us um, this morning. Uh, I pray that you'll have a, a good week and you'll be able to join us again next week. God bless. <laughs>